Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us today. And as folks uh, join in, I'm your host, Edward James. I'm going to be doing a little bit of housekeeping duties. Again, while everyone is filing in to the webinar, uh, I'm just going to do a little bit of uh, as far as house duties. Um, as you will see on your screens, you will have a button that is Q&A. And as we are going through the presentation, as our hosts and our moderator are going through the presentation, if you have some questions, please put your questions in the Q&A box. On the chat box, if you would please, uh, use that as a networking opportunity to network amongst yourselves. So you can put your name, your contact information, things of that nature, and use that as a networking opportunity. So we are really, really um, privileged and everything to have our, our guest speaker today, Gregory M. James, and also our moderator, Dr. Gwendolyn Henry, um, as far as on today's webinar. The <clears throat> background, of course, of, of, of our speaker, um, is he is the principal director, our director and principal investigator for Cross Timbers, uh, Apex Accelerators at the University of Texas, Arlington. Um, Cross Timber, of course, operates the Department of Defense Office of Small Business funded Apex Accelerators, which was formerly the PTAC program. Its mission is to help businesses to do business with government entities. In the last 10 years, Cross Timbers has served over 18,233 businesses, facilitated over 61,039 awarded contracts that are valued over $2 billion. Is, yes, that is correct. <laughs> okay. Uh, to over $2 billion. Uh, Gregory's areas of expertise includes DOD cybersecurity and CMMC compliance, contract management, government contracting procedures, federal acquisitions and regulations, market research, finance, customer service, and project management. Mr. James is a graduate of Jesuit Prep School, El Centro College, and receives his BA from Southern Methodist University Cox uh, School of Business. Uh, he also has memberships at the National Defense Industry, the NDIA, City of Dallas Diversity Task Force, the American Council of Technology Industry Advisory Council, and he is also a NTSB DC Advisory Board. And our moderator, Dr. Gwendolyn, Gwendolyn Henry, has been serving the private and public sector in program and financial management for over 20 years, supporting the Department of Defense, and she's also in the intelligence community, IC, United States Army, and the U.S. Air Force. Dr. Gwendolyn holds a bachelor's degree in business administration, a master's in public administration, and a doctorate in business administration and management. She also holds a Certified Defense Financial Manager, a CDFM certification. Dr. Gwendolyn is a member of the National Small Business Administration, NSBA, and Leadership Council. The American Society of Military Controllers, the ASMC, and the Southwest Virginia Diverse Chamber of Commerce. She has owned and operated businesses in Northern Virginia, North Carolina, and California. Dr. Gwendolyn also serves as an entrepreneur and transfer, transformational leader in her church and community. And when she's not working, you can find her loving on her family and friends, traveling, watching good sports, game, cooking, and being a foodie and fashion fanatic. Mm -hmm. Reading and hiking are some of her pleasures that she also enjoys. So again, I would want to say to everyone here, thank you for joining us today for our um, how to prepare a capability statement, which is a very important uh, uh, part of the whole process when you're talking about getting into the whole government contracting uh, piece. Uh, let me get off of here and come back to the full screen. 
Uh, again, Brother Gregory James, I greatly appreciate what you do what you do every day on behalf of small businesses. And you know, thank you for you know giving us or sharing with us your time and your knowledge, especially in the areas that you see that is that is either lacking or needing some help. And you see it all every day, all day. And thank you for sharing your time and your knowledge uh, with the folks that are joining us here on today. And Dr. Gwendolyn, I'm going to hand it over to you and, and Mr. James to take it from here. Uh, Gwen? Yes, I'm here. Okay, so Dr. James, do you have your slides? I know you said. Uh, that. Yes, yes, I do. <laughs> All right, I'll uh, I'll bring them up. We'll and, jump right yeah. into jump right into the uh, the meat of the webinar with you. Okay. Driving, and then if it, as questions come up, and we have some um, questions that were submitted, we will go over those throughout the, All right. of the webinar. Very good. Okay, well, I, I wish to think, uh, can, can you see my screen? Is that? Yes. Sir. Can you see it? Good, good, good. So uh, I, I wish to thank Ed and, and Gwendolyn for giving me the opportunity, and Rena giving me the opportunity to talk with you this morning about capability statements. And uh, we, we have a slide presentation we'll go through, and then, of course, we'll take questions uh, at uh, toward the end. Uh, this is just some basic information about where we're located and and and, and our website. What, what we want to discuss today is the purpose of capability statements, a brief description of the types of capability statements. Uh, we have a guide that we'll, we'll discuss in terms of what goes into the capability statements. And of course, uh, we'll, we'll also have a sample capability statement to review. So you can see what, what it looks like and at least, uh, and it doesn't have to look like our sample, but I think the information in the sample is very crucial in your, cap your own capability statement. All right, so HUD, uh, Housing and Urban Development, they, they say or that a capability statement is a promotional or marketing statement about how your business and its capabilities and skills that advertise who you are, what you do. However, capability statements must be tailored to your audience, the government buyer or prime contractor. Uh, that, that's really key that, that we tailor the content of your capability statement to the target customer that that you're you're trying to get uh, uh, contracts from or solicitations or or and the like. Uh, a lot of times people will do a capability statement and it's across the board. They use it for all different types of uh, it's, it says the same thing and they just send it out and it's a hit and miss. So our, our philosophy is, is that if you, if the content of the capability statement reflects the, the, the problems that your target audience has, it goes over so much better. Now, one of the things that, that we want to kind of blend together with the capability statement is not only your company demographics, uh, but also we want to talk about um, the value add and kind of the, the language that, that you should try and adapt in your capability statement so that the reader can see that you, you provide a lot of value. Uh, we're seeing that a lot on requests for proposals now. And uh, you know, cut, sometimes the the lowest bid isn't isn't doesn't always get the job. It's what kind of additional value do you bring to the agency? All right, so let's talk just briefly about the different types of capability statements. So, on a commercial basis, 
there's certain information that that commercial entities would like to have. So uh, you want to make sure that you tailor that information like, you know, to the Lockheed Martin or or to any uh, 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 J.C. Penney's, whoever you're trying to do business with. Uh, so there's a commercial thing. Then there's the federal government and then state governments. And then, of course, local government entities. Um, the, the, the capability statement is a word document. So you should be able to adjust the word document to these different categories. And, and I think you'll get a much better response. All right, I'm going to skip a little bit here and go into the format. Now, um, the format of the capability statement includes the following. One, you want to stay at the top that it's a capability statement. You want to show the company logo, color, main address, uh, telephone, fax, email, and website, of course. The capability statement is a one-page, one-side document. Use the back if necessary. It's a 30-second ele elevator speech. You know, uh, if any of you have done proposals in the past, you know they want to, they, they'll ask you about your capabilities and they'll want, you know, maybe four or five different pages of information that speak to that. This is a door opener. This capability statement is a door opener and it, it, stop, it, uh, it, you just want to say enough, but specific enough to get their attention and then go on to other, you know, to then look at some of the other references you would have in your capability document itself. We want to make sure we keep our file size under one megabyte, uh, which means that you don't put a lot of photographs. Uh, you put some color in it, but you don't, you, we, we want to make sure you get through the FAMS filters, especially at the federal level. So when you're sending it out to someone, uh, that that you've had some previous contact with, either uh, telephone calls or you met them at a trade show, you want to make sure that it gets through the spam filters that we see a lot in, in uh, uh, for federal for the federal government in particular. So you want to keep it under one megabyte. We want to tailor the content to a specific agency, prime or opportunity that you're going for. Readers will visit your website to get more detailed information, and we want to use short sentences, keywords, and take up the whole page. All right. Also, as, as an important guide here, is that there is a distinction between past performance and experience. Sometimes people get that mixed up. So uh, past performance basically talks about how well, how well you you've performed certain work. In other words, you know how well they executed what was promised in in the proposal. Uh, past experience, of course, reflects, you know, whether the whether you've done this work before, and and you want to be able to outline and say, yeah, we have done work in this area that, that you have deemed uh, as a target for your company. All right, so let's take a look at the handout. And if you'll bear with me, we will uh, we'll get to it. Um, I say we will, yes, 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 very nice. Windows. Okay. okay, guys, if you'll hang on just a minute. Thought I had it up, but we'll we'll get it up for you to look at. Okay. Um the template. Hmm. Okay. Okay. We do this. I apologize for for not having it ready. I thought I did, and and it looks like it's. Uh, I'm going to have to bring it up. So here we go. Yeah. 
Okay, we're gonna share this. So hopefully you see it. Oops, wrong one again. Um, there it is. Okay, share. Okay, can everyone see this? Yes, when it, can you, you can see it? Good, good, good. So this is the one page document. Now it's an eight and a half by 11 sheet of paper. We've divided it into two sections. The right hand section, it deals with demographics. This is information about your company that pretty much stays constant throughout, a, within a year for sure, uh, and maybe two years, depending on you know what updates you've done to your SAM registration and so on. So those are demographics. And then on the left-hand side, uh, we talk about these, this is the content that you can tailor to the specific agency that, that you're, you're trying to appeal to. So let's talk a little bit about on, on the, on the company demographics itself, uh, itself. So you want to include your unique identity ID, which by the way, that took the place of the DUNS number. So a lot of companies think they register with Sam just to get the the uh, the unique I, the UEI number, but you also have to complete the registration so that you get a cage code. And I kind of I, I look at the cage code as as the accounts payable code from Treasury. So we I had a client in uh, yesterday that talked that was trying to submit an SBIR, Small Business Innovative Research proposal, and he just had his UEI number, and he couldn't figure out why they said, well, your your registration's incomplete. So you want to get a cage code. That's, that's, that's the goal, is to have a cage code. Um, the next thing you want to do is your website. So it's important that you have a website. And um, uh, because your competitors do. So, you know, it doesn't have to be a real fancy website, but the website ought to say, you know, what you do. And if they want to see it, they just click right on it and they can go to it. The websites tend to have a lot more information than the capability statement. Uh, so we want to make sure that that you you list your web address. The next one is a LinkedIn address. Now it's optional, but we recommend that you, you that your company have a LinkedIn address. Uh, in case a lot of you don't know that LinkedIn, there's hundreds of thousands of federal employees on LinkedIn. And we have had clients that are very successful in marketing their services to uh, people they've been able to identify on LinkedIn. So LinkedIn is a very important uh, social media platform, and uh, we recommend that you have it. Also op optional, but recommended, is a YouTube presentation. Let's say you make something. So you want to show your potential customers how you make it, what the processes you go through. So a simple uh, YouTube video works very well, and it just adds a little more definition to the person looking at this as to what your capabilities are uh, and, and how you perform. The next one is your primary NAICS code. Now, in case you, you don't know, the NAICS NAICS code is a North American Industrial Classification Code. It's a system and it represents the industry that you're in. Uh, so it's important that you have one. And if you have a cage code, you you are asked to define what the next, you know, what your industry you're in by next codes. Now, how many next codes should you have listed here? Uh, we say primary. And if you have other next codes, they can be contained in your your uh, SAM registration or and or in your uh, SBA profile, uh, commonly known as DSBS. Uh, but we recommend you just have one. Now, if you have multiple NAICS codes, say you got five of them, and they represent five different industries or five different uh, revenue streams, 
you should have a NAICS code, a capability statement for each NAICS code. We don't want to confuse people as to what you really do. And a lot of people ha take the philosophy, well, we'll have a NAICS code, we'll use it like a fishing net, and I'll have every NAICS code I can find. So, I mean, I as soon as I see more than two or three, I tell the client, you need to, you know, do you have past performance to support these NAICS codes? Do you have experience? Uh, you know, so uh, it's it's very important that you use one. And if you have multiple ones, different customers, different revenue streams, then I would do a capability statement for its each NAICS number. The next one down is your pro is your primary product service number. The product service code is a four digit code that the federal government uh, anal uh, categorizes their purchases. State and city governments use an NIGP code, uh, which is a four digit code that they use to categorize their purchases. And so they're going to want you to put your corresponding number. Some of the differences be, you know, between the federal, state, and local government type capability codes because uh, or capability statements. They really don't care about some what the federal government's looking for. So you just want to make sure you give them uh, state related or local local government related uh, codes. Uh, you want it, uh, by the way, too, if, if you haven't figured out what your NAICS codes are yet or your product service codes, uh, there's a couple of really good websites you can go to. You can always Google NAICS uh, in Google or whatever search uh, uh, platform you use. And you want to go to the Census Track, the Census Bureau. They have, I think, the best definition. You can put in keywords and it will show you know, what the related NAICS codes are. Uh, also with the product service codes, you can, you know, just put in product service codes uh, and, and, and pick the one that makes sense to you. And then you can, you can also, then you can, you know, get the right definition. Uh, the best way to do this is to look at SAM.gov and to look at solicitations. So, so if, if any of you are familiar with how to search for contract opportunities, you know, you go to sam.gov, Sam you click on contract opportunities, and there's a keyword box that comes up. So you can select the, the, the title, you can select a solicitation that, that best meets your, your, your capabilities, and then you can look at the NAICS codes and the product service code assigned by the contracting officer to that NAICS, to that solicitation. That's a great way to, to make sure you got the right ones. Uh, the year the business started. Now, startups are have difficulty in getting federal contracts. Um, of course, it depends on the kind of startup you are. If you're a startup and you're reselling a product, uh, then you're bidding on what we call a request for quote from an agency. And so past experience uh, and, and the criteria involved for, for a, a proposal is, is not the same at this point because you're representing the manufacturer. And as long as the product meets, you know, the specifications in the solicitation, you know, you, 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 can, you can do that. But if you provide services, then you need to have been able to demonstrate uh, that you've done business and that that you have past performance and you have references. So usually what we're seeing from contracting officers, they like to see at least a year and a half, two years of good history and uh, uh, before they can make a decision, especially if pricing and all the other things are, are good. Um, so you want to be cognizant of, of the year you started. And of course, the SAM registration says the same thing. And I think the, uh, the SBA profile says the same thing. All right. Going down a little bit more, you'll see uh, socioeconomic certifications uh, within the federal space. 
there's, you know, if you're a woman owned business, woman owned small business, uh, you, you, you know, you should get a certification in that area. If you're a veteran owned service disabled veteran owned company, you'll want to, uh, you know, get that certification. If you, if your business is located in a hub zone, you'll want to, uh, make sure that, that, you know, you get that certification. And of course the 8A program, the SBA 8A slash SDB, small disadvantaged business, you'll want to uh, go for those certifications too, if you in fact qualify. So the, 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 the socioeconomic certifications are pretty much governed by or certified by SBA and they're, um, they're contractors that they've given the ability to do it. In the Dallas-Fort Worth area, it's, it's of course, a Women's Business Council, Southwest. Uh, they do WOSB. Uh, and and so uh, and they're a third-party entity, and they get it done a lot quicker than if you went to SBA.gov, SBACertified.gov, to go through their, their normal processes. Uh, just let me say a, a little bit more about social economic certifications. When you're trying to do business with somebody that you haven't met before or had experience with, the worst thing you can do is to open up your conversation. So, well, I'm a service disabled veteran. And that turns people that could turn them off in the opening statement. Uh, they may have had a bad experience with service disabled veteran owned companies. And so whatever you say after that, that experience will come up and it'll cloud their uh, listening to you in, in a more rational, fair way. So uh, I, I always tell my clients, talk about what you do and what your capabilities are. And, and somewhere along the line, you know, you got documentation or you show, yeah, we're, we're also certified. So that helps with the agency's goals as well as subcontractors. Um, bonding and insurance, uh, that's important, especially if you provide services and those traditional services require bonding, uh, you'll wanna put, yes, you do have bonding and you'll list the dollar amount that you've got. All companies have some form of insurance. So workman's comp and so on, you'll also want to include those in, in your capability statement. Now, remember, this is all one page. So uh, a lot of times people have to think about, well, what, what do I say about my company on one, in one page? Um, but that's what we do to help. And, 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 and the, and the, the, you know, the bid exec, uh, franchises can, uh, centers can help you with that too. Uh, quality certifications. The federal government does not require the type of quality certification, but they do want you to have a quality manual. They want you to have quality procedures. Uh, a lot of you may have heard about ISO or AS9100. These are, these are names of quality certifications that are offered um, by, uh, an, it has an international standard and, and just about all of the prime contractors, especially in aerospace, require AS9100 or they may require ISO certification packages. Uh, we don't see, we only really see that qualification at the federal level. Uh, we haven't seen much at the state and local government areas in, in that regard. Uh, but if you are wanting to do business with a federal agency and or a, uh, a, a prime contractor of a federal agency, especially in the Department of Defense, then you'll want to, uh, you know, if, if you'll, you'll want to allude to the fact that, yes, we have a quality manual. Uh, unless they require you to be certified by those international standards. Uh, if you if you have a contract vehicle, you'll want to list that. Uh, I consider a contract vehicle to be an indefinite delivery, indefinite quantity type of contract. Uh, you see that a lot in GSA schedules. Uh, and, and there are other contract vehicles that different agencies offer. So if you can qualify for one, I, I would definitely put 
you know, would put that in there. Um, it's not one of those things you, especially with GSA that you go do in a second. You know, I have people call and say, hey, I, I need to get a GSA schedule. And I go, well, why? Why do you need one? It's a very, takes at least six to eight months to get one. It's very intensive uh, re of your resources and time. So, uh, you know, uh, just, just, just be cognizant. If you do have one, great. And kind of the best way to determine if you do need one is to see what your customers are asking. If the federal agency is asking for you to have a contract vehicle, then that's something you might want. That might be a good enough reason to to get a GSA schedule or a Maytalk or any of the other different uh, vehicles that are out there. By the way, too, quick definition, a contract vehicle means that you, you are qualified, pre-qualified to do work for a federal agency. It keeps the agency from having to write a, a proposal uh, or, or to reinvent the wheel. They can just use a GSA schedule to evaluate your responses and to make the award uh, for a, a particular uh, uh, contract. Uh, any uh, business certifications, if you provide a service and, and it, it requires a license like a plumber or, or a contractor in, in certain states, uh, you know, you'll or you belong to an association, you'll want to list those in here under business certifications. Next one down is accept credit cards. It's very important that you have the ability to accept credit cards. Now, I know, you know, it's an expensive thing, uh, uh, but the federal government every year spends billions of dollars on credit card transactions. So if you, if you are unable to process the credit card, that just means that you're going to get paid later. <laughs> the check's in the mail. So uh, by accepting credit cards, you know, you can uh, you can get paid quicker. Now, you know, I have a client we're working with now that spent $68,000 last month on credit card fees. And because, you know, they charge you 3% or so to process that transaction. So he's actively trying to figure out how he can reduce that 3% um, fee and that's just, you know, something that takes a little bit of time to work out. Uh, but uh, it's, it's important that you be able to, to accept credit card transactions. Well, and then the last one in this section deals with contact name, email, and cell number. Remember, you've, already, you've got the address at the top, hopefully, uh, with your company logo and so on. And then here... You'll want to have the con, you know, the name of the person uh, that that's sending out this capability statement, and their email and their cell number, of course. So that's the section on company demographics. They stay pretty close the same, so you never should have to change them unless you've updated something. You've added a NAICS code, or you've added, you know, a product service code, or you know. Uh, uh, you know, that's, that's, that's viable thing to do. So now let's talk about on the left-hand side, which is what, which we divided into uh, sections, one dealing with core competencies, uh, B capability, uh, C past performance, D past experience, and E cybersecurity policy. And we'll get into that as, as we go forward. All right, so core competency, um, you know, what niche, what is your niche in the marketplace? Now, if you're an IT company and you do software, what kind of software? And, and because you can't be everything to everybody when it comes to IT, although there are lots of customers that, that want to, to do both software and, and sell products. But uh, you want to, you know, you want to say, okay, why do people do business with me? Why do my customers like me? And, and you specialize in a certain area that perhaps your competition doesn't. Now, we put these questions. You don't have to answer all these questions, but we put the questions in there just as a way to generate thought 
and so that you can think about certain things uh, as you you know fill in the the requirements here and remember we're still back to one page and it's bullet points it's not paragraphs so uh, a lot of times we'll see paragraphs of information on a capability statement and i send it back to them said hey you know, nobody wants to read a paragraph. Remember, this is 30-second elevator speed. So you want to be succinct. You want to be right to the point, And you want to uh, describe what you do in a very, very short space of time. So your capacity, you know, could include your ability to manage projects. Maybe you're a project manager and you've had experience managing five projects at one time. Okay, that's a capability. Uh, the equipment that you may use. If you're an architectural firm or an engineering firm, you have to do drawings. And so there's certain equipment that you have. If you're an IT company or, or, or say a construction company and you do certain kinds of construction, you'll want to list one or two uh, pieces of equipment that, that's used. Uh, what's your staff size? That gets That's kind of important. Uh, how many people do you have? What years of experience do they have? Uh, how do you finance your projects? Um, contracting people, before they make an award, they may ask you to present your financial statements and so that they can determine that you have the financial capacity to perform on the work. Now, they will ask you that you know, somewhere pretty close before they actually award the contract to you. Uh, and after they've picked, you know, said, okay, this is the company we want to do business with, we need additional information. Uh, and then, of course, how do you mitigate risk? And, uh, and the last one is, who are your teaming partners? Now, you, like I said, you don't have to answer all these questions, but I might, you might want to have the ability to react to uh, any, any questions that come up from you know, contracting person looking at your capability statement. Uh, mitigate risk. So understand, and this is where the quality standards come in too, by the way. Um, if if I haven't done business with you before in the past, and I'm taking a risk that you're going to perform. Uh, yeah, I've checked you out. I've looked at all your references and so on, but I'm still taking a risk. So you want to figure out a way to mitigate that risk or say something that that helps the contracting officer feel a little bit more comfortable it's a lot easier when you do have selling a product because you can always come back and say uh well if it's not the right product ship it back we'll we'll ship the right one to you at no charge you know uh and and we see that a lot with products uh when it comes to uh, perf uh, uh services then it's more like, okay, here are the specifications. We built the, you know, we're doing the job based on the certifications. I mean, specifications. And if if the job's not acceptable uh, or the inspector that comes by to look at it while you're doing it, make sure you make the corrections as soon as possible. Uh, and unfortunately, a lot of times people in this area, don't read the, the the award that they've gotten, less known the solicitation that they filled in. And there, there are certain areas that in that award where you, you know, you're responsible for delivering the product or service that they have asked you to deliver. Teaming partners, great, great thing that to be involved in, especially if you're a small business, especially if you're new, uh, say within a year or so, you can always team up with a larger company. And uh, and a lot of the federal, in fact, all the federal agencies have a mentor protege program where they will allow a small business to team up with a larger business. And that larger business provides services and cap additional capabilities to the small business and it's done under the umbrella of the, of 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 the agency, so you you know you're kind of exempt from what SBA calls uh, you know affiliation problems and so on. So 
Uh, I think I think the Mentor Protege is an excellent teaming arrangement. You also have sub prime. Uh, you have joint ventures. There's all sorts of different ways to team up, you know, on uh, with a larger company that has got more capabilities than you do uh, to help bolster your capabilities. All right. So that's kind of the capacity section. And like I said, you don't have to answer all these questions, but we put them in there to help you think about, you know, what, what you would want to talk about in your capacity. Uh, past performance, how well did you perform on a similar project? So if you're going after, say, you've identified the, the Department of Navy as your target customer uh, based on research and all sorts of different things you've done, and in particular, Navy likes a certain process or product or service that you provide, then you want to demonstrate, yeah, we've done this before. And here is the information on, on what we did. So uh, that past performance has to be related to the target agency you want to do business with. Okay. Um, and then, of course, past experience. You want to identify two, two projects with references that can tell the, age, the contracting officer how well to a certain extent, how well you performed on the job. Now, a lot of you may know that once you complete a job, uh, especially a, 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 a service job, that the contracting officer will give you a grade and they will put it in uh, uh, SPRS, which is a software uh, database that is for performance ratings. So, um, you know, that... That's something you want to make sure that you have there. Now, um, uh, Gregory, uh, yes, question sir. for you right there. On yeah. that past performance piece, uh, as you are aware, uh, our attendees today, they are interested in as far as, as far as getting that government contract. And if you are, if you haven't received, uh, you know, your first government contract on a federal level, uh, as far as past performance, it, could that be from your commercial experience or from, say, your local experience or or state experience? Can you? Yes. Can you? Because I get that question quite a bit. Yes, it can be. It does not have to be a government contract. Uh, so, uh, yeah, no, you 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 can put in your commercial past performance as well. Um, yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, now let's talk a little bit about cybersecurity policy. So in an effort to, uh, basically protect the nation, it's a national security issue that DOD especially, and it looks like we're, we're anticipating all federal agencies are going to require compliance with this FAR reference 52.204-7012. And so uh, we know DOD, I've even seen within DOD, I have seen products, uh, solicitations for a, for bash, a limb and, you know, eyeglass cleaner. And they want to, know and identify, are you in compliance with, with this regulation? I didn't think we'd see it much on products as much as we would see it on services. That's DOD. And at some point, um, you will not be able to get a contract unless you are in the compliance process with cybersecurity. Um, so this, this FAR regulation deals with the following points. One, uh, the NIST uh, 800-171 questionnaire. So it's 110 questions that you would need to answer. Yes, no, maybe. I think you have four choices. And then once you've answered those 110 questions, it, there, a score will come up. And then you're obligated to upload that score to that performance system. Um, so, and we have that questionnaire uh, in an Excel file. 
which makes it easier for you to answer the questions and then you automatically get a score and then you post that score. So that's the number one thing you've got to do. And I think DOD especially thinks of cybersecurity policy as a maturation. It's, it's, it's a process. You can't get it done overnight. And it's, it's an expensive process. So uh, you just have to make sure that, that, you know, that what you're bidding on is worth the effort. We have a lot of machine shops that have pulled out of the supply chain because a defense supply chain, because they didn't want to spend the time and the money to upgrade their own information systems to protect information flow between the agency and 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 the machine shop to make something, to make a product, to make a part. Uh, so there will be fallout uh, with within the supply chain. Uh, so you, this is a good time to think, is it worth going after federal contracts? And uh, so it's a business decision that you have to make. But I will say, if you do make that decision to do it, that puts you in a very competitive edge because your competition may not be there. So you want to make sure you want to, if the contracting officer has to make a decision between, yeah, X company that good price, good value, but they aren't in compliant with, with, with the uh, regulation versus the one that is apples to apples, then they'll take the one that is in compliance. So it, it gives you a competitive edge uh, against your competition. But like I said, within within DOD, pretty soon you won't be able to bid on any contract uh, unless you have this. And we know NASA, we know SB, uh, not you know, NASA, DOE, Homeland Security, and uh, will 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 stretch this. You know, will will make sure that this compliance is in every solicitation that that goes out. Uh, for people to be aware of that they have to, you know, start the compliance process. Uh, and the the FAR regulation is in the final stages. And once that gets approved by the FAR council, then it'll be in every contract over time. I'd say probably in the next eight months, it'll be in every contract you see at the federal level. So it's best to get started on that now. Uh, also, the requirements are a plan of action and milestones. So if you do the questionnaire and you've identified some areas that you're weak in and the government's going to want to know, okay, what are you doing? What are you going to do to solve it? The biggest uh, expense is the system security plan. And the system security plan, basically, after you've done your 110 questions, then they're going to want you to know what are you doing to your system security to your information system to make sure that it's, you know, that, that you've tightened up as much as possible. So it can be a pain. It's, it's an expensive process. I've seen as much as $25,000 charged by consultants to, uh, to, you know, to get, to get you ready uh, for the compliance. We do anticipate, we've been told that DLD, especially with larger contracts, We'll have an auditor come into your facility and we'll be able to determine the level of compliance. They'll give you a number, a one, two, or three, with one being, you know, you're just, you you know, you're caught items. You're just selling products. And to two and three, with with three being like Lockheed Martin, or the, you know, where, where you've got security everywhere and, and uh, secret levels and all that kind of thing. And then two is where we think the sweet spot will be for a lot of our clients, uh, either manufacturers or providing services, number two. So soon you will see solicitations in SAM.gov that will have that level of compliance that you need to be, one, two, or three. And uh, if you don't have those, or say you have a, a compliance level of number two, then you'll only be able to bid on those solicitations that have number two in it. So uh, 
and and we're, we're here to help with that uh and and, and all the uh, apex accelerators across the country should be able to help you understand this the the compliance factors with the cybersecurity and um you know it's in the best it's national interest it's in the best interest of the country that you protect the information that's flowing between you and an agency and uh, so minimize the the the, right. the bad actors out there doing this so and on that part uh again i'm sorry for interrupting no sure um, the on that part does when you start talking about teaming partners and things of that nature, is that an area? Let's just say I'm a small business and right now I can't afford to 25,000. Okay. Right. Or right. It, it's, but if I work with, let's just say a Lockheed Martin, is that like an umbrella effect or is that not going to be the case? Well, if it's a, if it's a mentor protege teaming arrangement, Okay. They will tell the agency what kind of assistance they're going to provide you. So you negotiate up front with the mentor that, yes, can you help me get, get my uh, cybersecurity policy in play? So, yes, that's an acceptable, what we call developmental assistance that they're providing. Um we know that, as you'll notice, uh, the, the fourth thing down, incident response plan and reporting, and then subcontractor flow down requirements. So if you get a contract from a prime contractor, they're supposed to flow down the requirements to their subs. And then, it, and then they're going to want you, this will be the second tier in the supply chain, then they may want you to flow down those requirements to your subs. So uh, I know in a lot of cases, Lockheed Martin, the big primes, uh, if, if you're in a, a relationship like that with them, they will help you. And because it's in their best interest that you are in compliance with cybersecurity. So, yeah. But it's in a, like I said, it's a business decision that each of you have to make and decide that, you know, is, will I make enough margin <laughs> in my products and services to cover this cost? And will it provide me access to more contracts? Uh, j just like any other decision you would make to spend money. So, yeah. Okay. All right. All right. Well, it looks yeah. like uh, we're at that time where Okay. Unless, of course, you got more to discuss on this. Go, go well, right ahead. I mean, the the uh, the the rest of the uh, uh, presentation uh, kind of deals with uh, um, factors of affecting best value. So, uh, and and we can get that presentation to you so you can see, you know, what what different kinds of things that that contracting people will look at. And you'll want to try in I want to trying to determine is this a best value bid? Uh, you'll want to kind of put some of that language in your capability statement. Um, warranties are big deals. Uh, there's there's all sorts of things. So would, that can be shared at a, at another time. Okay, uh, okay. Dr. Henry, if you would please, uh, if you would go over some of the questions that have been asked and. Uh, then we will be closing it out uh, in about five minutes. Okay, yes, thank you. And thank you, Gregory, for this uh, valuable information, specifically yeah. on how to format, format excuse me, the capability statement. That was one of the multiple questions that we received from the attendee, attendees. Um, a few of them asked the question, how would they improve their capability statement or if they already have one, how would they make it better? So would it be a fair statement to say as long as they follow this specific format to compare, you know, what they have yeah. to what you just went over? Yeah, I, like we have clients that will send me, especially after an event like this or a webinar, they'll send me what they currently have. And I'll evaluate what they have based on this model and and so um 
and I'll give them feedback on it. And a lot of times, unless they're using this model to fill out, uh, if they already have a capability statement, more than likely uh, th this would be additional information or new information they may want to add. So, and, and like I said, we see a lot of paragraphs in capability statements. I mean, you know, that what I call marketing materials as opposed to sales. And so, uh, yeah, yeah, we, we, uh, we, we, we try and give them feedback on what changes they should make and so on. And the, the big deal is coming up with a capability statement for each NAICS code. Mm. That's where the real challenge is, especially if the NAICS codes that they sell under have different customers. So uh, yeah, that's, that's important. Okay. That, that's a great thing to mention in, in, in that, uh, as far as having the different NAICS codes, because I've, I've come across that where yeah. um, a client will have multiple NAICS codes, but their capability statement only speaks to maybe one or two. Yeah. Yeah. So that's a, yeah. that's a good point to highlight. Another question, one of our attendees um, asked from Mont Montec LLC, they want to know how or where to start um, once having their capability statement, where to start as far as pursuing government contracting? Would you sure. say starting as a subcontractor, um, would that be a recommended action? You know, uh, yes and no. I think if you start as a subcontractor, you'll learn the ropes a lot easier mm -hmm. because you'll be relying on the sub, I mean, the prime, to guide you on on what they need. Uh, and it's a great way to kind of get started, to get into the game. But we want prime contractors. And and so um, the best, you know, the best way, of course, I mean, somebody will come in and say, well, I want to do government contracting. They have all these credentials. And I said, okay, go to sam.gov contract opportunities and do keyword searches. So contracts will come up under those keywords. So that gives them a really good idea. Is, is the government buying what I'm selling? And and the best and 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 then the other way is that you get leads, lead lists from doing that. You know, at the bottom of each solicitation is a contact person. So uh I always recommend that look at all of them that, that are pertinent, same Nate's code, same product service codes, or, or same description of, of work, statement of work, uh, build a leads list, and then get on the phone and call them and, and, and leave a voicemail in most cases and just say, hey, I want to send you my capability statement and I want to make sure you get it. And then once it's sent to you, I'll follow back up with you to, to uh, you know, to talk about it, give me feedback, or to see if there's opportunities. So I hope that answered your question, or the okay. the you know the attendees' question. Okay. Yes, and of course, BitExex is here. Yes. So I have some business development support, capture support. Um, you can reach out to myself. Business Execs Center in Virginia, GwendolynAvidExec.com. Yeah. So we're also yeah. here to support those efforts and pursuing those contracts. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Most no, it's a... Yeah. Sure. So, did you want to add to that? No, I, I, I just want to say, you know, business development is the key. And, um, uh, and everybody has different definitions of what business development is. The capability statement is a tool for business development and uh, uh, and then the solicitations in sam.gov you can buy you know there's all sorts of services out there but <clears throat> if you stick to the context at the bottom of each solicitation that you see in sam then you know that person is is familiar with what you're selling so that that helps a lot Okay, and we have a few more minutes. Um, we've gotten many questions about receiving a copy of the presentation and also sure. someone wants to know will they be able to get a copy of this template to follow? 
Uh, yeah, yeah. You want me? I I can work them through you. Okay, absolutely. And, and, and then you could send them out to everybody. How's that? Yes, that, that, that 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 will work perfectly. So all the attendees will get a copy of the presentation and a link to this recording. Yes. Along with the template as well. Along with the template, correct. Okay. So okay. Conclude our presentation. I'll turn it back over to, to Ed. All right. Uh, again, I want to say thank you so much, uh, Dr. Henry, and also Gregory, uh, for, again, this educational and also very, very much needed information to help our small businesses continue that path of winning government contracts. And when I say government contracts, I'm talking about not just at the federal level, but also right. there's very useful information for the state and local and right. of course, there's commercial application as well. Um, again, we want to say thank you. Uh, again, uh, Dr. Henry, Dr. Uh, Mr. Mr. Um, uh, James, I want to just say again, we greatly appreciate you sharing and everything. And we're going to call it a wrap. And uh, we will see everyone again, uh, hopefully soon, uh, at our other. Uh, webinars. So be on the lookout for additional webinars uh, from BitExecs and Proposal Helper. Thank you all.